a biblical perspective on life, culture and current events. This is 2020 on Vision. Well, today we're going to actually take a look at global entrepreneurs and business executives of Fortune 500 companies and also influential pastors and ministry leaders and dig down and see what they do when the pressure is on. It will be really encouraging for all of us to, to work out today that what a lot of these people do is they pray. So today we're going to talk about the spiritual habits and techniques and prayer practices of world-changing leaders. Our special guest has interviewed 100 world leaders about their prayer lives. His name is Peter Greer. He's the author of the book called Lead with Prayer, The Spiritual Habits of World-Changing Leaders. Peter is also an in-demand speaker and president and CEO of Hope International, which is a global Christ-centered organization working to alleviate physical and spiritual poverty in more than 20 countries around the world. And Peter Greer is all the way from Lancaster, Pennsylvania in the US of A. Peter, welcome to 2020 today. Thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to this conversation. Well, so are we, Peter, because it seems like the world right now, doesn't matter which nation you're in, this world needs prayer, doesn't it? Yeah, well said, well said. Yeah, and really the origin of this was uh, this recognition that there's a lot of books that have been written about leadership, and we can find all kinds of their habits and techniques, but there was never anything that we found that really dove into what are the prayer habits of leaders. And in the work that I do with Hope International, I get to rub shoulders with an incredible group of global leaders. And what I saw, what I experienced is that these global leaders, there was a different level of depth and prayer. And so we just wanted to listen and we wanted to learn how, how can we find those leaders that truly start and end uh, with prayer, with a prayerful posture, are not trying to do this work on their own. What can we learn about them and what is the intersection about leadership and prayer and how might that change the way that we lead? How might that change the way that we pray? Yeah, amen. You know, you're from Pennsylvania. Are you born and bred Pennsylvania? So uh, my father was a pastor in Massachusetts, so I grew up in Massachusetts, but uh, I've been with the organization called Hope International for 20 years after living in a couple international spots, started in Cambodia and then in Rwanda and then in Zimbabwe. So uh, uh, not not born here, but 20 years I've been living in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Well, you're, you're really well-traveled, aren't you? And a lot of our Australian listeners won't know the history. William Penn, I believe, started Pennsylvania, and from memory, he was a Quaker. Uh, he was a part of that Christian group that the, the power of God would come upon them and they'd start to shake and quake in their meetings. And he birthed Pennsylvania. America has got such a rich Christian history. You may not be aware, Peter, Australia does not have the same rich spiritual history. Sure, God's been working here and we've had different men and women over the years really labor for the Lord and see fruit as well. But what I love about your nation is you've had legitimate national revivals where God has just touched your whole nation. Uh, and William Penn is, a, is just one of many stories of good God-fearing men and women that started your nation. But do you believe uh, today, are there a lot of Americans tapping into those deep spiritual roots and really asking God for a, a new awakening? No, I think the challenge is when there is uh, a level of success, uh, it is so easy, and the well-worn pattern is to say, look at what we did. Look at, and then to rely on one's strength, one's charisma, one's abilities. And in the latter years of ministry, the tendency is to rely on our own gifts, our own abilities, as opposed to a reliance on Christ. And we know the story. We know the story. What happens when we rely on our own strength? Those stories don't end well at a personal level, and they don't end well at an organizational level, and they don't end well on a national level as well. So we are absolutely trying to say, how do we not lose that? How do we have the sense of, apart from me, you can do nothing? What does it look like in our leadership to abide in Christ and to do that individually, but then to create cultures in the places that we work, in the charities in the churches to say, let's have a vibrant prayer culture. And if we look at, you just mentioned movements, every single movement is birthed in prayer. We did this research about all the different prayers that have happened around the world, not just in the U.S., and 
Prayer was absolutely one of the foundational pieces. And so really, this uh, this research, this project, uh, we're praying for it again in our day, in our lifetime. Another revival uh, to come Peter. and hearts to be turned to Christ. Yeah, well, tell me some of your favorite stories. I do want to zero in on the U.S. because uh, my understanding is the church in the U.S. is actually in decline numerically. I mean, sure, there's mega churches that have sprung up in the last 20 years, and it's created an illusion that the American church is strong and healthy. But it is in decline unless God moves again. But tell me some of your favorite stories about American history when God has really touched your nation. Oh, there are so uh, many, but a couple of the ones that I just was so uh, impacted by. Uh, one of them was with, uh, we had the opportunity to interview Johnny Erickson Tata. And Johnny Erickson Tata is someone who has lived with chronic pain. Uh, she was in a diving accident when she was a teenager. She lost uh, the, the use of her, her physical body. Uh, but I tell you, Andrew, in the conversation, she was so alive. She was more full of the Holy Spirit than virtually anyone I have ever met. And and we asked this question of Johnny, like, what is it like to live with unanswered prayer? Because in many ways, her prayers for her physical healing have not been answered. Her prayers for the relief of pain have not been answered. Uh, but she said something so profound. She said, I'm still praying for those things. I'm still praying for relief. I'm still praying for healing. But she said, I'm making sure that no more than 20% of my prayer life is on that particular issue. And then the remaining 80%, I'm saying, God, would you be glorified in the midst of my pain? God, would you grow me to be more like you? God, would you use this pain to allow me to empathize, to have compassion, and to impact others? That radically reshaped our prayer lives. And so we still pray for whatever the issues are, but but we want to pray that even in the midst of that, that there would be this sense of God's presence. And, and, and she introduced us to this idea of Psalm 23, that Psalm 23 starts out with these well-known words, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But it's interesting, she said, did you know that it changes from the Lord, third person, to you, and the minute that that changes from the Lord, from the third person to the personal experience is in the valley of the shadow of death. That's when it's no longer the Lord, but that's when it shifts to you are with me. You is the word that is described. And and so I think that that's something that, uh, that just one of the many conversations and the way that she leads is with a sense of let's start, let's incorporate, let's be an organization, let's be a people uh, that starts on our knees, starts with prayer. And uh, it was just really beautiful to think about what are we praying for? And is it possible uh, to broaden our prayer life to say, God, even in the unwanted circumstance, would we experience your your nearness, your presence? Yeah, amen. Uh, Joni's actually had a big impact in Australia. Ever since I was a new Christian, I still remember seeing her books in Christian bookshops, and she's got quite a name out here. How old would she be now? She must be in her 70s or 80s. I have uh, learned not to guess on the age of, <laughs> of other people, Andrew, so <laughs> I'm not sure. But I, I, I mean, I've seen a book for about 30 years, but that's the story of an individual. But Peter, I'm going to repeat the question. In America's history, what is one of your favorite stories about a revival that has touched your nation? It can be from 200 years ago, 100 years ago, a time when God has moved, when the people have prayed. Yeah, thanks for that. And and this story, I had such a uh, unusual experience. This was not in the book, uh, but in the book, we did talk about the Moravians. And in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where I live, uh, the Moravians have had this tremendous impact. And I love your story of William Penn as well. Uh, we do have this rich history that still makes an impact in our communities. There still is this unquestionable tie to faith uh, that, that we can see and that we benefit from and that we experience. Uh, but this story uh, was from uh, Count von Zinzendorf and really a small group of Moravians. Um, it actually started in in uh, in Eastern Czech Republic, and there was so a group tell of our listeners what that, Moravians are. Some of our listeners won't know what a Moravian is. It sounds like someone from Byron Bay in Australia. So what's a Moravian? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's just one of the denominations uh, on that. But very early on, uh, this idea about global missions um, and really this integration of of faith and work as well. Um, and so uh, they were trained in in Bible, uh, in outreach, um, in in evangelism, and they were trained in carpentry. And so they would go, and as they were facing religious persecution, they went out. But this small group 
of individuals had this global impact. And it started as they were leaving that they they committed to pray. They committed to pray not just for themselves or their families, but they committed to pray for global revival. And it started the 100-year prayer movement, a 100-year prayer movement. And Count von Zinzendorf, and there's some great things that have been written about him, but but it really was this sense of let's start on our knees. And literally, that is what brought uh, faith to this particular area. The names of the towns connect. I mean, we're right by Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and Nazareth. Uh, and it really was all of this that in the midst of persecution, in the midst of fleeing, uh, they saw this as an invitation to say, God, would you use our displacement uh, to bring many into your kingdom? Uh, and so literally the area that I'm in uh, so clearly ties to that 100-year prayer movement, that revival uh, that happened and, uh, yeah, that we hope continues. Isn't that amazing? A 100-year prayer movement. And these Moravians who were from what is modern-day Czechoslovakia, which is kind of where the Bohemians were from as well. The Bohemians were sort of these rebels also. I think they were from the Austria-Hungary area who rebelled against the Catholic Church at the time because they believed in individual faith. But incredible, incredible, a hundred-year prayer movement. And that touched and helped birth cities and towns which still exist in the U.S. today. I want to ask our listeners, have you got a favorite story from history about a time when God moved. Maybe you love stories about the Welsh Revival or the Great Awakening in America or the revival under the Wesleys and, and George Whitfield in the UK or Martin Luther in Germany. Share a story that inspires you to pray because these stories should inspire us. They should motivate us and actually give us the, the ammunition, the spiritual ammunition to reach out to God and say, God, do it again. Maybe you love the story of South Korea. That 120 years ago was really a Buddhist nation. Today's almost 50% Christian because the Christians in Korea started to pray. Have you got a story, a favorite story from history about revival that inspires you and encourages you to pray? We're talking about revival. We have a very special guest with us. His name is Peter Greer, and he's written a book called Lead with Prayer, The Spiritual Habits of World-Changing Leaders. And we're going to get to that. We're going to get to some great stories from some of these um, spiritual leaders around the world. Some of them are in business. Some of them are church leaders. But I'm asking the question today, is there a story from history that inspires you to pray for Australia. Australia is a beautiful nation, as we all know. We've had pockets of revival. We've had God move in different times in our history, but we've never had a national revival. We've never had a move of the Holy Spirit where the nation has been shaken for the Lord and many have come into his kingdom. And that's what we really need in Australia, as most Western democracies do need today. But I'm asking you for your story that inspires you, that you love hearing about or reading about. Give us a call on one 1- 800-316-316. And we've already got a caller. His name is Mike, and he's from Tasmania, Peter, which is this giant island at the bottom of Australia. And maybe you can visit there when you're in Melbourne in a couple of months' time. It's a beautiful, beautiful part of the world. But, Mike, have you got a story from history that always inspires you to pray for revival? Well, whether it was John or Charles Wesley, whichever one, um, he, he was not yet born again, and he met the Moravians on a ship and and came to be born again himself. That's right. What happened was there was a massive storm, and everyone was freaking out and panicking. And, uh, yeah, it was I think it was John Wesley, and he thought he was going to die. And he was amazed that the Moravians were so peaceful. They had no fear. And I think he even – and all the English uh, passengers on that vessel who were going to America were screaming and carrying on like a bunch of football hooligans because they were terrified as well. And Wesley went to these Moravians and he said, are you people not afraid? And they said, no, we're not afraid. We're trusting in God. And they said, but what about your kids? Like Wesley said, what about your kids? And they're like, they're not afraid either. They were just so peaceful, just so in God's presence. And you're right. And that really led to uh, Wesley's salvation. That's a great story, Mike. Mike, do you like to pray for revival for Australia? Well, I I pray. Yeah, well, revival is a good thing. It is. It is, brother. I pray for it in my own life, and <laughs> it took, you know, I've got to have it in my own life continually, and uh, yes, and elsewhere. Yep. What about you, Peter? Did you know that story about the Wesley, uh, about John Wesley being on that boat that was in that storm, and uh, that was part of his salvation story? Yes, we did hear that story uh, as part of our research as well, and I love that. And for me, it's just one more confirmation: his beliefs impacted his actions. He he actually believed that this life is not all there is, and he lived his life accordingly. Uh, yeah, no, I love that story. Thanks so much for bringing it up. 
Yeah, Mike, appreciate your call, brother. You just keep praying for revival in yourself and in Australia and in Tasmania, and uh, we're all just standing together, aren't we? Thank you. Good on you. And we got another call, Anne from Queensland. Anne, are you there? Where is Anne? We're going to find Anne. There she is. Anne, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Have you got a story from history that inspires you about revival? Well, I've got um, Billy Graham, but the main part was I went to William Graham, his grandson, on the Gold Coast um, on Saturday the 29th, and it was such a wonderful time to see all these Christians, um, non-Christians, coming down and receiving you know, Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. There were so many that came down. And then also um, one of the people who sung these uh, songs got all the people to come down the front and they were singing and dancing and clapping and yelling and, and just giving, you know, giving their hearts to sing to the Lord. So I love that because that's a continuation of Billy and Graham who came over and um, many people came to know the Lord. So I was very wonderful that I was there in person to see all this. Good on you, and I'll just fill Peter in. So, Peter, two Saturday nights ago on the Gold Coast in the state of Queensland, Will Graham had a one-night event called Look Up Celebration, and hundreds of people came forward to give their lives to the Lord, and uh, it was a great time. And his grandfather, Billy, had huge impact in Australia in the 1950s. I think it was 1956. We have a cricket ground. Now, you would have heard of cricket, that weird game the English invented, and uh, we have a cricket ground in Melbourne, which is the biggest venue. And to this day, Billy Graham holds the record for the amount of people they squashed in to the Melbourne cricket ground to hear him preach. And many, many people were saved in that 1956 crusade. And it went all around Australia. But the truth is, though, the churches weren't really ready for it. And a lot of those people didn't translate into followers of Christ in their local church or in a local church. But still, God used Billy Graham to shake us straight. And I want to thank you so much for your call and uh, inviting other callers as well. If you've got a story about history, about revival that inspires you, let us know because we're talking today about revival. But Peter, did you, did you know that rich history that Billy Graham has had in Australia in years gone by? No, and and just uh, to to admit it, uh, Australia is a nation that I've never been to, and so uh, what I have seen is through the news and through the press, and not a lot of deep knowledge. And so I am so grateful that I'm going to be finally making it to Australia, and uh, that's coming up in less than two weeks. So I am so excited for the first time that I'll be able to be there and uh, learn and meet some uh, incredible brothers and sisters. So so looking forward to that time. I have so much to learn. And tell us, uh, that's a very humble statement. You're obviously coming out here to speak, though. Tell us what the event is that you're going to be here for. Give it a bit of a plug now. Yeah, I mean, there's several events. So if you're going somewhere for the first time, you try to fit in as much as you can, right? Uh, but on uh, July 26th, I'm going to be with uh, CMA, uh, and uh, that's in Melbourne. And uh, that's going to be for an opportunity to share a little bit about, um, yeah, most of the events are about leadership, uh, about prayer. Some of them are on the book, uh, but you can learn more about all of them at cma.net.au. Uh, so a little bit of time in Melbourne, and then in Sydney, there's going to be a breakfast on July 29th at Grace Sydney Hotel. And uh, at that one, that's going to be very much talking about Lead with Prayer. And uh, my son and I are bringing as many books as we can to uh, to share with friends uh, that are going to be there. So yeah, that's, uh, that's it. And then a couple other conferences that I'm so looking forward to uh, having some time uh, with them as well. So you said you've only seen Australia from the TV and, and media. So were you a big fan of Steve Irwin back in the day? I, I think everyone in the U.S. was a big fan. Absolutely. I mean, he was so well known um, and the adventures uh, that he had. Um, so I think I'm going to if I don't come back with a story about some uh, encounter with some, uh, you know, animal, I, I'm, I think my friends are going to be disappointed here. Well, you might be able to come back with an outfit that, used, that he used to wear, those khaki shorts and the khaki <laughs> shirt, but um, you'll be hard-pressed to find someone in an outfit like that. Well, not if they're in their right mind anyway, but um, yeah, th- there's quite a funny story to Steve Owen because in Australia, he wasn't that big, and then he went over to America and became huge, and then yeah. Australia suddenly embraced him as being huge as well. It's almost like America made him, believe it or not. A lot of us Aussies, I'll be honest with you, used to think he was a bit, you know, a bit crazy, like 
running around kissing snakes and, you know, patting crocodiles and everything else. We're just like, that is weird, you know. But then he went to the States. You guys just loved him, ate him up, and uh, he became international. And then he, and then in Australia, he was really recognized and celebrated. So, yeah, in the state of Queensland, which is where Anne just called from, just north of a town called Brisbane, which you aren't visiting this time, that's where his zoo, it's still there. His family still run it, Australia Zoo. So next time you'll definitely have to visit Brisbane so you can check out Australia Zoo. But we've got another call here, and this uh, person's calling all the way from Townsville, which is about 2,000 kilometres north of where, I'm, where I am right now. It's, uh, it's right next to the, uh, the Great Barrier Reef, which you had heard about. And uh, welcome to the program. Have you got a story about revival that inspires you? Uh, yeah, and I was sort of caught up in a small um, revival myself. How, you know, I often wonder how big is a revival is. You know, is it, um, I see pockets of revivals, you know, small revivals. So how big is a revival? That's a good question, mate. I mean, what is revival? It's, sometimes it's just reviving our own heart, isn't it? Sometimes it's reviving yeah. a church. Sometimes it's reviving a city. Sometimes God touches... A nation, but I suppose it's just when the Holy Spirit moves, when God just refreshes and revives and stirs things up and the things that are most important to people are the things of God, not the things of this world. That's how I define it. But quickly tell us what inspires you or a story of revival. We've got 45 seconds till news. Well, I just see what's encouraged me is just seeing people come to the Lord. Sorry, was that one directed to me? Sorry, Andrew. No, to our guest um, Shane from Townsville. Got it. Thank you. Just to see people coming to the Lord, Andrew, I just... A number of people at once, and sometimes I sit on TV and at church, and and it sort of excites me. You know, just I'm just excited to see people come to the Lord. Amen, uh, amen. Yeah. Peter, uh, in 20 seconds, mate, what's your response to that? This caller, uh, Shane from Townsville, just loves seeing people get saved. To him, that's revival. Absolutely, well said. Uh, I think that's uh, that. That's it. What is it? What is revival? Hearts being turned, and then not just an individual, but then that catching on. And so I love that passion. I share that passion. Uh, we have all seen those individuals going from death to life, a heart warmed, and uh, the impact of that. So yeah, thanks so much for sharing more of that. Now, the last hour we we're talking about revival and stories of revival. This hour we're going to focus a little bit more on leaders and and the prayer lives of different leaders that Peter has interviewed. But Peter Greer, I want to welcome you back to 2020 today. Thank you. Such a privilege to have the conversation. Yeah, and just to put it out there, we'll also give this a plug at the end. Peter will be in Australia uh, next weekend. It's only about 10 days away from now. He will grace our shores. All he knows about Australia is Steve Irwin, Crocodile Dundee, (laughs) and that there's a couple of kangaroos hopping around. So he's coming with some very realistic expectations. (laughs) But I'll give you the tip. You won't meet many people in Melbourne that look like Steve Irwin, that's for sure. Not in the khaki shorts this time of year. It's, it's, It's winter time. So uh, it's a little bit cold for the khaki outfit. But, um, Peter, we do have another uh, caller coming through now. But before we go to that caller, um, tell me a story of one of these Fortune 500 company leaders that you uh, interviewed and discovered that prayer is actually a part of their life. Because we all know pastors pray. That's a given. But it's great when you hear about business leaders praying as well. So tell us about a business leader that you interviewed who has a, a prayer life, who really relies on God to do what they do. Oh, there are so many, and that was part of the fun, is oftentimes we think about leaders who pray, and we might think about the the church sector, and we might think about ministries, but there are so many leaders in the business sector that also have that same heart and commitment to prayer. Uh, So two, just real quick, uh, one of them, his name is Terry Looper, and he's an individual who uh, runs a large uh, company, and um, he talks about every decision that he does. Um, It's not he doesn't even set metric goals. He doesn't even set strategic plan because he said that limited my ability to listen to the Holy Spirit and the guidance in that decision. So he has no metric goals. He has no kind of official like strategic plan. And each decision is done with listening to the Lord. And so he waits 24 hours before making uh, business decisions. And in that 24 hours, he is praying, he is seeking the Lord. He talks about getting his heart neutral. So he truly wants the Lord's will more than his own, and he is leading with prayer in just a beautiful and compelling way. So that was that more is, than I mean, Let's not rush that. Like, that is so encouraging. Do you, are you allowed to tell us the organization that he leads, so the, the business, or is it sort of hush-hush? 
No, no, no. He's he's spoken uh, publicly about this, um, uh, but the company is called Texon. It's based in Texas, um, and uh, it's in the energy sector. Um, and he's been leading it for thirty years, and uh, it has grown tremendously. Uh, last uh, I saw, it, the revenue was the same as the country of Belize, like the whole country of Belize. So, I mean, it, it absolutely uh, works at scale. But really, just saying, Lord, lead me in this decision in the work that I do in a really beautiful and compelling way. But the other story, Andrew, that I'm so disappointed because it didn't get in the book, but there was a Fortune 100 leader, and uh, he is just, not just himself, but he created this culture of prayer at a very well-known uh, company with a global brand and a global reputation. And um it was just really amazing how he has done this in, 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 in a place that anyone who says it wouldn't work here, I think, needs to hear his story because he's figured out a way. But literally, last minute before the book goes to print, uh, we got a note from him saying, I'm so sorry, but his legal department uh, would not allow his story to be in at the last minute. Um, and I was so disappointed on that because... His story really does stretch the bounds for anyone who says, well, I couldn't do that in my organization. Peter, you're doing that at Hope International. You're a Christian ministry, uh, but it would never work here. And I think that his story really stretched the bounds of, is it possible to be a leader who prioritizes prayer? And I think the answer is yes, regardless of place of work, regardless of sector. And uh, so that story is not in the book, but it was very inspiring to me. Yeah, well, they both are. But that first one, that the guy spends 24 hours in prayer, like that is true humility, isn't it? And I want to explore that a little bit more. But we've actually got a caller, and I don't want to call, uh, have them wait too long. And I think it's Robin from Victoria. Are you there, Robin? Yes, I am. Have you got a question or a comment or a story for us today? Uh, a story. Tell us your story. Well, it's a true story for starters. Um, yes, I'm a 59 baby, as in 1959, um, when Billy Graham came to Australia, to Melbourne, I'm pretty sure, and did his crusade there. And anyway, my parents did not live in Melbourne, <laughs> but in a town called Benalla in Victoria. And uh, they went to oh, his televised, but it wasn't television, it was radio, radiovised um, service from Melbourne, um, came to Benalla and think to lots of other places as well. Anyway, my mum and dad went to that session in the town hall in Benalla and my mum was pregnant with me at that service and I was there too. And I just stand in awe of that because I know um, Billy Graham has had a great influence on my life. Look, I never met the man, don't know the man, I only know the little bits and snippets here and there, but I've always been drawn to this Billy Graham and, um, and then to find out that I was actually in my mum at the Billy Graham televised, radiovised program at that time in 1959. And, um, and I just feel, wow. All I know is I've always been drawn to Billy Graham whenever I've heard his name and the things that he's done and all the rest of it. And, um, and even just recently, I'm 64, 65, <laughs> 65 years old now. And um, just recently, a friend of ours has the record of that service. And we were allowed to copy it, and I've got the 1959 Billy Graham service that I went to <laughs> via my mum. Um, in your mother's womb. Can I ask you, Robin, do you think you leapt in your mother's womb when, uh, when Billy Graham was preaching? <laughs> well, who knows? I know I don't know. <laughs> There's every chance. I'm going to say um, you I did. Like I'm going to say you did. Now, Peter, I'm just going to translate for you, okay, because I speak Australian, and uh, Robin's from Malacuta in Victoria. Peter can't hear because we're, uh, we're coming through teams today, Robin, but uh, Robin's just shared that in 1959 when she was in her mother's womb that Billy Graham was in Australia and preaching and uh, the mum was listening via radio, and, uh, and it's weird because Robin feels a real connection to Billy Graham's ministry ever since. And Robin and Peter, both of you may not know this, that it was either that crusade or one in the 60s that the owner of Coles Supermarkets, which are now the you know Coles and Woolworths, are the two biggest supermarkets in Australia, the owner of Coles actually financed for Billy Graham's uh, meetings to be broadcast on every radio station in Australia. So behind the scenes, there was a great business leader as well supporting yeah. Billy Graham. And because of that, so many thousands of people across Australia heard Billy Graham preaching and, and many were saved. 
as a result of that. So, yeah, the, the Graham family definitely have a rich history in Australia, don't they, Robin? Oh, they do, absolutely. And I just feel so blessed because of well, all of that connection. And I was hoping to actually get to, say, meet the guy, but there's no way I could get to America. And <laughs> But um, but I, I, well, I have met him. Through the spirit of the Lord, I have sort of met Billy Graham. And I just feel so blessed to have been, in a sense, a part of his ministry. Um, it, yeah, just awesome. I just I can hardly understand for myself the connections and how this has all worked. And even my parents, I tried all my life to get my dad saved, as in keep him telling about the Jesus, about Jesus, and give his heart to Jesus. He wasn't a big talker, very very little talker actually. My dad, and so I don't know what he was really responding in what I was trying to do when I got saved at sixteen years of age. I was desperate to get my dad saved, <laughs> and then I don't know fifty odd years later, whatever it was um i find out that my dad was at the billy graham crusade and he went forward and gave his heart to jesus oh isn't that nice well robin (laughs) i i i I want to thank you for calling in robin and i'd also like to say to you you are 65 years young okay so uh just remember that you're not 65 years old you're 65 years young no you're right you're absolutely right i say that all the time in fact about 20 years ago i remember saying god i do want to grow up and get older but i don't want to grow old yeah, well, you're not. You're not going to. So uh, we're like Caleb. When we're 80, we're going to be saying we're as strong today as we were when we were 40. But, Robin, I want to thank you so much for your call. And, uh, Peter, just uh, – and God bless you, Robin. Call us again sometime. Yeah, Robin was just saying how her family have really been connected to the Billy Graham ministry. And uh, even her dad went forward in a Billy Graham crusade. And, you know, uh, Peter, up until about 20 years ago, I think in Australia, maybe 30 years ago, any Bible college in Australia it used to be said, if you say to it, the whole class – Put your hands up if you got saved in a Billy Graham crusade. There was always at least one hand that went up. So, yeah, the the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association has had a huge impact on Australia Mm. and on our Christian history. But let's get back to that dude, that Texan. Mm. I like this guy already. So he's spending – so I'm guessing he's making – the company's turning over billions. When you say it's got the same, you know, GDP as a a small country. Mm. So this guy's got multi-billion dollar decisions he's making – and he spends at least 24 hours in prayer before he makes a decision. Isn't that incredible? It really is. It really is. And it's not just the big ones, but you can tell he just wants to abide in Christ uh, before he makes decisions. And truly, I love that idea about getting your heart neutral, because sometimes, you know this, we can say a prayer as almost like a little, uh, God bless me as I do what I really want to do. God bless me as I go in the path that I've determined I want to go. And he has a very different posture, really humbling himself and saying, God, let me get my heart to a place where I want your will more than mine. Let me listen to you and believe that God is still active. Uh, God does provide guidance, does provide direction. Um, And so he gives himself time and space to do that. One of the other leaders that we had, he had this phrase, he he said uh, he he wants to waste time with God. And this is someone who lives in New York. His name is John Kim. And uh, he also makes very large uh, financial decisions um, as well. And and he said he just wants to waste time with God. Uh, That's how he described prayer. Just this idea about being with Christ, being with Jesus um, as he goes about this busy uh, yeah, life and work of living in a very busy city. Yeah, and really, I mean, to give our time to God, it's, it's one of our greatest sacrifices, isn't it? One of our greatest offerings, because we all have such a limited amount of time on this earth. But you know, going back to that first guy, that to me is real humility, isn't it? Just to humble yourself before God and say, God, you know what, I've got this massive organization. I'm a kind of a big deal around here. I'm the CEO or the founder or the president, whatever his title is. And yet, God, I need you to make a wise decision. To me, that's real humility. I think a lot of Christians think humility is just talking down about yourself and pretending that you're no good at things. Oh, no, it's not me. It's the Lord and all that stuff. And I call that false humility. But I think a really humble man or woman, uh, Peter, and I'd like to get your thoughts on this, is someone who does spend that time with God in prayer, who literally knows they can't do whatever they do in life without prayer. And I see this modeled in Jesus. He didn't just turn up, like you said, with a Red Bull and a cappuccino, get in the zone and just start sprouting off all this wisdom, which let's be honest, a lot of Western pastors are like that these days. It's like they spend more time teasing their hair and getting their Red Bull and cappuccino than they do praying. And and and, and they're awesome. But you know, Jesus didn't model that, did he? He modeled prayer as a form of God without you. I can't even do this today. And, and your guy in Texas said, what are your thoughts on humility and prayer? 
Oh, you're so right. You're so right. And isn't it interesting? We read about Jesus, who arguably was a lot busier than you or me. He had lines of people waiting to be healed. He had crowds flocking to wait to hear him speak. I mean, think about the demands. And what do we read about the prayer life of Jesus? Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed, not sometimes. And did you know that as the ministry of Jesus increased, there are more, not less, instances where he would he would retreat. He would go away to be with his heavenly Father. And, and before big decisions, what is he doing? Before he chooses the disciples, what does he do? Night prayer vigil. He wants to spend all night praying. And what does he do the night before the cross? Limited time, Jesus. You got limited time. What do you want to do? I want to go to a garden. I want to pray with my friends. That is a prioritization. There is so much in the prayer life of Jesus that seems so far disconnected to the prayer life of myself um, and others. And and so uh, I want to learn from the Master. I want to learn from the prayer life of Jesus. And isn't it interesting, too, Andrew, the disciples could have asked Jesus anything. Jesus, teach us how you do these miracles. Jesus, teach us how you, you, you communicate like that. The only thing that we have recorded is a request from the disciples, and the request is this. Jesus, teach us how to pray. They saw something in the prayer life of Jesus, and they said, I want to learn how to pray like that. Uh, so there is so much to learn from the Master, uh, to, to learn from the prayer life of Jesus. Um, and I think all of us would do a little bit better if uh, a little bit more time on our knees and a little less time looking in the mirror. I think that's a good trade right there. <laughs> and maybe a little bit less time taking selfies as well. But um, so, so tell us about some other leaders, some business, because I'm fascinated. I love hearing stories of business people that pray. Um, you know, I, I don't know about you, Peter. I, I sometimes think of heaven, and I've heard someone say this. And they went to heaven once in a vision, and, and the people they saw as prominent in heaven really surprised them because it wasn't just pastors and leaders and priests. It was generals and, you know, and presidents and leaders of nations and businesses who, in their own way, had served God in their generation. And many people didn't even know they were serving God because God had put something on their heart to do and they did it. And uh, and I just believe some of those heroes exist today and we don't even know, but you know some of them. And I'm really curious, how did you get to meet all these people? Like, how did you meet the Texaco guy? Like, what a great interview that was. <laughs> It was great, yeah, and and so I think so. I didn't write this alone, and and the original um, uh, friend who came up with the idea, he said, "I want to learn about the prayer lives of leaders." Um, his name is Ryan Skoog, and so Ryan invited me and Cameron Doolittle and uh, Jill Heisey, and so we just went on this journey together. And I got to clarify, I personally did not interview a hundred leaders about their prayer lives. We divided, uh, but over a hundred hours were spent listening. Uh, to an incredible group of of global leaders, but but yeah, that was the fun of just like who do we know, and then we really followed what Jim Collins does in Good to Great, which was reaching out to like people who know industries, people who know sectors, and say who are the people in your sector that really demonstrate an uncommon prayer life, um, and we just started having conversations, and we're all one degree of separation away, um, and so we just uh, found a way of connecting with them, and and uh, it. It was so incredible. But Terry, he's been a good friend for a long time. I've had the privilege of traveling uh, with him to several different countries to see the Ministry of Hope International. Um, but uh, yeah, all kinds of friends. And uh, I think about our friends in the Philippines um, that we got to interview, Ate Ruth uh, Kalenta, just a vibrant woman of prayer. Um, anyway, so yeah, lots of lots of uh, wonderful stories, wonderful times of uh, just listening and learning and really doing what the, apost- what the disciples did. Uh, of Jesus coming to them and saying, tell us about your prayer life and then tell us how have you created a prayer culture in your place of work. Well, tell me one more story about a business person that prays a lot that comes to mind. Oh, yeah. You know, one other, uh, one of the leaders that we um, uh, had early on uh, that really shaped uh, this uh, was an individual uh, who's uh, perhaps well known. You might see him in church, but he's got a lot going on. But Francis Chan uh, is someone who also uh, participated in in the progre- project and 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 just incredible. To me, it was just this prioritization. The thing that struck me is he said, if you are not uh, on, if you are on my team and you are not committed to prayer, please let me know 
uh, so that we can terminate employment uh, and find someone who is committed to prayer. Like, that's how seriously he took it uh, on that. Uh, but yeah, many more. But I hope some of your listeners will join us in Melbourne or Sydney. Uh, we're going to have more time together for those yeah, conversations. And uh, if anyone has an interest, I know the book's available on Audible and, and some other formats. Um, but uh, so fun to learn from the global church, to learn from global leaders about what does it look like to really start um, and really lead uh, with prayer. Yeah, so encouraging, Peter. So if people want to connect to you and get their hands on the book, what's the best website for them to find that book and to find more out about you? Yeah, I mean, so if you want to learn more about me, um, uh, the work that I do is hopeinternational.org. And um, everything that we have at Hope, we open source. We we uh, we believe in in uh, cheering each other on. So if there's anything that we have that might be helpful to you, go to hopeinternational.org. Love to connect there. Uh, personally, you can learn more about the books that I've read, um, uh, books that I've written and uh, been involved with at peterkgreer.com. Um, and then if you want to learn more about the events uh, that I will be uh, at, you can go to cma.net.au. Uh, those events, uh, 26 July, 29 July, and a bunch more, but I think they're all available on CMA's website. That's right. So he's doing a Melbourne afternoon session on the 26th of July, and he's doing a breakfast in Sydney on the 29th of July at the Grace Sydney, which is in the CBD. And I really encourage you to check this guy out, hopeinternational.org. It's a great ministry. He's touching about 20 countries around the world. Just another story of a good American and a good American ministry that's just doing its best to reach the world and build the church and and build God's kingdom. And uh, any final thoughts for us today, Peter, before we end up? No, I just hope I see you, Andrew, at one of the events in Australia. Hope to see you in person, but uh, so looking forward to that trip. And uh, my son is going with me, so it's going to be a father-son adventure. He's turning 16, and uh, we're real excited to uh, to learn and connect with some new uh, friends and, and brothers and sisters in Christ. Oh, that's nice. Well, I've got a 14-year-old daughter, so maybe we can arrange an organized marriage or something for them when they're a bit older. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to put your son through some rigorous testing first, though. He'll have to pass several initiation tests and uh, strength, agility, you know, intellect, all that stuff, financial capacity, all the good stuff, you know. <laughs> but, uh, I look forward to it. <laughs> I'm sure he'll look forward to it as well. But, uh, Peter, I really appreciate your time today. So encouraging. And, uh, yeah, I'm sure our listeners in Melbourne and Sydney are really looking forward to when you visit our shores and i hope and pray this is not the first trip but it's the first of many trips to australia come and bless us peter thank you so much thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from vision christian media to find out more about us go to vision.org.au